Uh, happy Mother's Day to all you mothers out there. Uh, it's definitely a special day. And uh, today we're in our series uh, on the Upside Down Kingdom. We're going through the book of Acts. Today we're going to just speed through like three chapters, 13 through 15. Uh, before we get into that, um, numismatics. This was the word that my college world history teacher uh, came in and said. He was like really eccentric and kind of crazy. It caught us, we're kind of, Whoa, what was that, you know? Uh, and we also didn't know what it meant, but numismatics is the study of coins. And what he taught us is that you can learn a lot about a civilization by what they print onto their money. And uh, I thought, man, what would it be like, like 2,000 years from now, they dig up an American quarter. What would they think about us Americans? Um, they would see, you know, here's a, here's a bicentennial quarter. Um, they would see liberty, like uh, freedom was very important to these people. They trusted in God. Um, something happened in this year, 1776, and it's like they commemorated it 200 years later, and they potentially have the coolest hairstyles out of any coin that we've ever dug up out of the ground. It's a shame, though. I was just thinking this. Like, they will never see, like, the 90s box cut because there's no president has ever sported that. It'll never be on money. Um, they would see the United States of America, and they would see E Pluribus Unum. Anyone know what that means? Out of many one, he said it. Yeah, out of many one that we are a United States. Check out this coin. This is from 71 AD. This is just right around 30 years after Jesus uh, was crucified and rose again. This is not the guy from Little Caesars. This is uh, Vespasian. This is uh, an emperor in 71. He started in his reign, I think it's around 69. And this little, there's three little marks right here, and they would stamp this for every consecutive year. So this is the third year of his reign. Um, neat, neat. I don't know what that is. Um, but look over here. This is a I, it looks like a V, but it's a U D E A, Eudea. This would be Judea, right? Right here. And then Capta. This is where we get captured. So it's commemorating when Judea was captured and the second temple was destroyed. It was his son, Titus who did that, and it was under his reign. Let's look at the next one. Same year, third year of his reign, 71 AD. This is Vespasian, a little bit different coin right here, but this is interesting right here. You know, we know that the, uh, we just kind of heard it in that scripture reading, uh, Zeus and Hermes, the gods of, of ancient Rome, the goddess of Roma. This is the goddess of Roma. They believe that even Rome itself was a deity and was to be worshiped. Um, Roma provided your country and your governors and your sustenance and your food. Um, and we see the seven hills of Rome. Rome sits on seven hills. And often the emperors, when they died, they were later deified and they would worship the emperors. And so you would see that Vespasian as the son of the goddess, right? The son of God. Like the, it was this weird uh, tension in Roman culture. Uh, Flavius Josephus, who is a Roman historian, uh, and a Jewish man, um, he believed that the Jewish identification of the Messiah was wrong, that they got it wrong. He believed that the Old Testament prophecies were all fulfilled in the Messiah in Vespasian, and that he was the foretold son of God. How crazy is that? That's weird, right? Um, we have cultural amnesia. We just don't know what it was like to live back then. And this is the culture, this is the time where the New Testament was written. This is where Paul went out on his first missionary journeys, and he went out into this world that was completely foreign. Today, today whether, you just, uh, whether you ascribe to uh, any religion or not, we think and speak in terms of God as being one singular deity. But in the Roman Empire, that wasn't the case. They have uncovered uh, at an archaeological site in the eastern side of the Roman Empire uh, an inscription, and there were over 40 gods that they were worshiping in this one city. It's kind of crazy. Um, in every country or ethnicity, remember, the Roman Empire is a conquered uh, empire. They still have countries. They still have people groups. They still have ethnicities, right? In every country, every ethnicity or nation had an inseparable religion. It was woven into the fabric of who you are. You didn't interchange that with other cultures. You just accepted uh, a larger like bucket of gods that you would worship. Religion wasn't a choice in the Roman Empire. You didn't voluntarily like choose your religion. 
It's just who you were, and you definitely didn't change religions. That was just something you did not do in the Roman Empire. But one could choose Christianity and remain almost completely true to their ethnicity and culture. It would infiltrate, it would cross barriers into different cultures. With Christianity, we see, uh, I think Paul writes this in Galatians, where he says, like, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, there's neither male nor female, slave or free, but all are one in Christ Jesus. This Christ-centric identity was really foreign to the Roman Empire. The fact that you could be Christian first, that was your identity, and then whatever else you used to be was secondary, was completely foreign. Acts 17, this is kind of where we get the the language for the upside down kingdom. It's talking about these men that have turned the world upside down. And the reality is, it was more than just a few men. It was Jesus and his teaching and his followers that were literally turning the world and culture upside down. And in Roman eyes, there was something about this new faith and its leader that were completely unsettling. They didn't like it. It scared them. Eventually, we see that Christianity comes out from up under the protection of Judaism and on its own, it's outlawed. It's completely against the law to be Christian. And if you're found to be Christian or you're a Christian leader, you're simply put to death. It wasn't until Constantine in, 300, uh, in the 300s that Christianity was made legal. And so we see that from about this time that we're looking at, there's probably less than 10,000 Christians in the world. But within three centuries, it completely takes over into millions and millions of followers of Christ. So it's a very, very unique time in history. And this is the setting of Paul's first missionary journey. This culture where he's venturing out into new cultures and ethnicities all up under the Roman rule uh, to influence and to teach Gentiles uh, about Jesus. So we're going to be in our Bibles, uh, Acts chapter 13. Put on your seatbelts. We're going to go pretty quickly. Um, but let's pray before we dive in. Uh, I'll pray for us. Lord, thank you for this day, for this opportunity to be here uh, together, gathered with your believers, uh, singing in worship. Lord, I pray that you would help us as we open your word to, to gain understanding, that you would open our eyes and our ears to hear the message that you want to speak today. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would work on our hearts, that we could get a better glimpse of Jesus and his power in our life. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Acts chapter 13, uh, starting in verse 1, it says, Now, there were in the church at Antioch. Antioch is in Syria, just north of Israel. There's two Antiochs in the story, so this is the one in Syria. Uh, Prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, I think that's how you say that, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch. Herod's the one that put John the Baptist uh, to death, so his lifelong friend, and Saul, who was persecuting Christians. We've got kind of a shady bunch of guys here, uh, but they have been transformed by Jesus. Uh, Verse 2, it says, While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. Cyprus was an island in the middle of the Mediterranean. And Paul did what he did on every city that he went into for the first time. He would just go to the synagogue. And from there, he let the Holy Spirit lead them into what his next conversation was. And so he meets this false prophet, this magician or sorcerer in some of your Bibles. Uh, and his name is Bar Jesus. And Bar Jesus serves the governor whose name is Sergius Paulus. And Sergius gets word of this message that Paul is teaching, and he wants to know about it. He wants to hear this teaching about God. And it said that Bar-Jesus was trying to deter him. He was trying to turn him away from the faith. And so Paul looks straight at uh, Bar-Jesus and says this in verse 10. He says, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately, mist and darkness fell upon him and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul, that's the governor, believed when he, had saw, uh, when he saw what had occurred for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. It, it kind of fascinates me here that this man was just blinded in front of him and that's not what he's fascinated about. 
He's fascinated about what? The teaching of the Lord. It was so fascinating. It was so different from Roman culture. But what was that teaching? His teaching was pretty simple. Paul's gospel message was that Jesus Christ has come as the Messiah. He died for your sins. Through his sins, you can have salvation. But he rose from the dead. God came in flesh. That was foreign to the Romans. God came in the flesh and Jesus. And then he rose again. He lives again. Not only that, but through your faith in him, you gain eternal life. You gain resurrection. And this was like, in Roman culture, you didn't come back to life. Um, And so this was just a fascinating thing. And so the proconsul actually believed. He witnesses this miracle, but he's so fascinated by the teaching of Jesus, he's all in. So Paul sets sail. He is uh, now approaching mainland Turkey. And when he hits land, I did this on uh, Apple Maps or Google Maps, I think it was a 47-mile walk up to the next city, which is Antioch at Pisidia. And I think he's pretty tired because it's a long walk. So it says he went to the synagogue and he sat down. Verse 15 says, After the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them saying, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. And so Paul starts with Egypt. He takes them back in time. And he he looks at scripture and he takes them through the coming into the promised land. He takes them back to King David. He points to all these scriptures and how all of this has been fulfilled in the Messiah, how we've always been looking for the Messiah. And then he tells them, good news, the Messiah has come. He went to Jerusalem, but they didn't recognize him. And then they put him to death. And then we pick up in verse 30 and he tells them this, but God raised him from the dead. And for many days, he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. And we bring you the good news. That's where we get the word gospel. Gospel literally means good news. So we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus. And he showed them all of this through scripture. Now, I don't know what kind of encouragement those uh, religious synagogue leaders were looking for when they asked Paul to stand up. But what Paul didn't do is encourage them by what he saw that they were doing for God. But he encouraged them by telling them, this is what God has done for you. And I would say that like great encouragement for us as Christ followers is not what we are doing for God, but it's what God has done for us. I coach a a, a little league baseball team. Well, I help coach And I'm on first base. Uh, I really don't know what I'm doing. Poor kids. We're champions, by the way. We got first place. Um, Our encouragement is just a little bit different. We're like, come on, buddy. You got it. Next next time, man, don't put your head down. Come on, hustle, hustle. It's like we're, we're constantly telling them like as if they have this from within themselves to accomplish uh, this game to be champions. I don't know. Um, but life is just a whole lot more difficult than a little league game, right? The encouragement we need as Christ followers is not, hey, man, you got it. You can do it. Look within yourself. You have the strength there. (laughs) Oh, man, I don't have the strength here. Like, I just don't have what it takes to get through uh, the pains and the trials of life, right? The encouragement we need is the gospel. It's the encouragement that Paul gave him, that Jesus died, that your sins are forgiven because of that death. You don't have to worry about that anymore. That should, that should be some relief to you. But more than that, he was raised from the dead. And Ephesians says that the same power that rose Jesus from the dead is available to you to work in you and through you in order to accomplish God's good purposes. There is a power available to us, and that is the source of our courage. The source of a strength and courage for a Christ follower is not, come on, you got it, you can do it. It's Christ died, and it's his power living in us that gives us the strength uh, to move forward in life. So this is the encouragement of Paul. He tells them all about Jesus. And they're actually really excited about this, both the religious leaders and the Gentiles that were there present. So they say, Paul, you got to come back next week. You got to tell us this same message. There's some other people that need to hear this. And the next uh, Shabbat, uh, for them it was Saturday, Friday, Saturday, um, they would show up to the synagogue and it said the whole city was there, the whole city. And it said that the Jewish people were filled with jealousy. They saw the crowds of the Gentiles and immediately they turned off their ears and they turned off their hearts 
to the gospel of Jesus Christ. But the Gentiles heard the good news and they responded and it said that they were given eternal life. It was incredible news. The Jewish people then started to stir up this persecution. They got some people in the town to come together and they literally just forcefully kicked them out of the town. So then they go to the next city, which is in Iconium. And in Iconium, Paul does the same thing he's done for the past two cities. He goes to the synagogue. And the Jews hear the message again. The Gentiles hear it again. The Jews reject it again. It just it eat, sleep, repeat. It just keeps going, same thing. But this persecution starts to stir just on a deeper level. And instead of kicking them out of the town, they start planning to stone and kill Paul. But Paul catches wind of the plan, and so they get out of town. And so they go to this town where we had our scripture reading today, Lystra. And so Paul steps into the town. He goes to the synagogue. He starts doing his teaching. He sees this crippled man. He heals him in the name of Jesus, and the people go nuts. They think, oh, my goodness, the gods have descended in mankind, and we need to sacrifice uh, to these gods. And, of course, they're, like, totally distraught by that. They tear their clothes and say, no, we're just men just like you. We just worship and serve the living God, right? And it is about this time that the men from Antioch and Iconium come together, and they were able to persuade this crowd, this crowd that was just worshiping them, now persuaded them to pick up rocks, and they literally stone Paul, and they think he is dead, so they grab him, and they drag him outside of the city, and they leave him there. But it's not the end of the story. So the disciples circle up around Paul, and Paul just stands up, and he walks right back into the city that just stoned him. That's crazy to me. I, if I were just stoned, I would not walk back into the city. Like, you just did that. Like, no, man, I'm out. Y'all can have that. Um, this is crazy. And so, like, the next day, him and Barnabas go to the next city, which is called Derby. Things go fairly well there. Thank God, a city that didn't just completely destroy them. But what Paul does is from this point, he backtracks through every single city that he went through, and he encourages the believers, and he builds them up. He strengthens the church. The church is now meeting in homes. They're not meeting in synagogues. And he appoints elders, and then he sails back to Antioch, the church where he was sent from, to go deliver the good news about what had happened on his journeys. And this brings us all the way to chapter 15. Y'all okay? All right, we're here. And don't you know, if you've got good news, there's always somebody to rain on your parade, right? Yep. So 15, verse 1, it says, But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you're circumcised, according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. So right in the middle of all this good news and celebration, there's this, right? And so this stirs up not a little fight. This is a big deal between Paul and Barnabas and the church people there. And they say, hey, we need to go to Jerusalem. We need to go talk to the apostles and the elders there, like the apostles that walked with Jesus that are the eyewitnesses to all of this, and we need to settle this. So they travel down to Jerusalem. They're meeting there with Peter and James and the apostles and the elders of the Jerusalem church, and they debate this thing for a while. And then Peter stands up and he tells them, look, it's always been God's plan for the Gentiles to come to him. It's part of God's redemption story that you see throughout the Bible. And in verse 10, it says, Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. And so, like, they understand, like, Peter had this experience. We heard from it last week, you know, uh, about how the Gentiles came to faith and were given the gift of the Holy Spirit. Paul's experienced the same thing, but then there's this sect of the Jews that says, oh, well, that really doesn't count. You really need to be circumcised next. Uh, and so this uh, debate uh, is settled by James. He stands up in the middle of the group after they all come together, they're all in agreement. And he says in verse 19, he says, therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God. It was troubling what was happening to them right now, these new believers in the faith. So what I want us to do right now, like, let's put ourselves in the shoes of a new believer, Gentile, in the Roman Empire. You've heard of these gods your whole life, but you've just heard this different story of a God that was made flesh and lived, that he loved you in such a way that he sacrificed his life. 
but he didn't stay dead. He was raised again, and you get the opportunity to have eternal life through faith in him. And this is mind-boggling to you, like, oh, my goodness, I don't know about this. But something just draws you in. It's almost like there was a Jesus-sized hole in your heart, and you've tried to fill it with every single thing in your life, and it just left you empty until this moment where you put your faith in Jesus and all made sense. You have this purpose. You have this freedom. You have this eternal life that you never had before. You've got this freedom and joy that you've experienced for the first time in Christ. And then someone comes to you and says, well, that really didn't count. You need to be circumcised. You know, like, you, <laughs> wait a second, stop. What? What are you telling me to do? Like, that is no doubt troubling, right? That would trouble me uh, for someone coming to faith. Um, and the truth is, religion can be so heavy sometimes, right? We see that picture right here. Sometimes we can feel this religious pressure to look or to act a certain way. And a lot of times we pick this up from other believers. God was not saying the Gentiles needed to do this. People were. The apostles saw the danger of putting the weight of religion on the necks of new believers. And we have to be careful of the same thing. All of us are on a different journey with Jesus. And that journey is transformation. God wants to do something in the minds and the hearts of his believers. He doesn't want them to look a certain way. He wants them to be changed. He wants them to be a new creation. He wants to redeem humanity back to himself. But it can be troublesome to put the weight of our convictions on the neck of another person, right? The best thing that we can do, like Paul, is to encourage somebody to pursue the way of Jesus and to let the Holy Spirit have the room to work, right? This results in true change of a believer, a heart work of the Holy Spirit, not just some kind of behavior modification. So I'd been saved for about a year. I think I was 19 years old. And for the first time in my life, I walked through the doors of church willingly. <laughs> my, my parents drug me to church. I'm thankful for that. Uh, but at the same time, that was kind of a hard, hard time in my life. But the first time I willingly walked through the doors, I actually wanted to hear the sermon and I wanted to be in worship and I wanted to raise my hands because what God had done in my life through faith in Jesus Christ was incredible. Like I was a new person. I had been delivered from so much and there was a new purpose and a new joy in my life. I was on fire. I mean, I walked around with my Bible everywhere. And in this church, a lot of people had nicknamed me 180 because they saw that I was going this way in life, but I now was like going the opposite way. Like they visibly saw a change. And I remember walking in through the lobby and I'm just like, oh, so good to be in church this morning. And the tap, tap, tap on the shoulder. You know, and this gentleman pulls me off to the side and he's like, <clears throat> you know, you shouldn't wear that in the house of the Lord. You know, like, what? And I'm kind of looking around. He's like, shorts. You should not wear shorts in church. I see some of you guys wearing shorts. And I'm telling you, it's okay if you wear shorts in church. <laughs> not picking on you guys. But in that moment, I felt this weight, this heaviness, like, oh my gosh, I've done something wrong. Like, what I've experienced and what you're telling me right now aren't lining up. And I feel, I don't feel good right now. You know, and I just constantly began to see this pressure from Christians to look a certain way, to do a certain thing. And it just didn't line up with the transformation that was happening in my heart right then. The way of Jesus is that he wants to transform us. And that is a work that happens on the inside, then it works its way out. Religious pressure wants to conform us. It wants to put this pressure on the outside of us to try to work its way in. And that threatens actual transformation. And I think the apostles recognized this, and that's why they said, hey, let's not trouble them the ones that are coming to Christ, because Christ and his Holy Spirit and his power is going to do a work. Let's not mess that up. Let's get out of the way of that. But they did see an even bigger threat, and they included that in their response letter. So they send a letter back to the church in Antioch, pick up in verse 23, and it says, the brothers with the apostles and the elders, to the brothers who were of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia, greetings. Since we have heard that some persons have gone out from us and troubled you with words, unsettling your minds, although we gave them no instructions, it seemed good to us, having come to one accord, they're all on the same page, 
to choose men and send them to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same things by the word of mouth. For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled, that's idolatry, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. So a real short letter, one of the first letters that does start to circulate among the churches. I think that one in Galatians are probably right about the same time, uh, late 40s. And we see this letter. And so not only was religious pressure threatening believers, but there was a cultural pressure that was shaping them. It was conforming them in ways that are contrary. They are op- opposite. They are opposing to God's created and established order. This would be detrimental to the transformational work of the Holy Spirit. The way I see it, idolatry, sexual immorality, or rebellion to God's heavenly order and God's earthly order. If we want to experience transformation, we have to be in alignment with God, not in opposition. Culture was pushing them, it was conforming them out of alignment with God. So let's look real quick at idolatry. We're going to wrap up real quick. Um, you want to write down this reference right here, 1 Corinthians 10, 14 through 22. Paul says, flee idolatry, and then he kind of expands a little bit on the thought. But here's the thought here. If we participate in idolatry, what we're saying is that God is not all-powerful and that he's not to be worshipped above all else. Idolatry says that there's other power available. There's something else or someone else that we need to trust. It says that God is not enough. That's what idolatry says, that God is not enough. And who are we to say God is not enough? How can the created say to the creator, you're not enough? How arrogant, how prideful is that? At the heart of idolatry is pride. It's this self can do it. I've got it figured out. It's better my way. In scripture, we see that God opposes the proud, but he gives us grace to the humble. Idolatry puts us in opposition to God's transformational work in the heart. The apostles say, hey, you will do good to stay away from idolatry. Now, ancient idolatry and modern idolatry probably look a little bit different. And I would ask the question, what in our lives takes the place of God that we put our trust or we put our hope or we, we find our strength in? And we may start to discover some areas in our life that become idolatrous, right? Things that are elevated to God's position that we find strength from. Okay, so let's move on. Last one. Most amazing topic on Mother's Day. Sweating a little bit less now than I was first service. I mean, I literally couldn't get the words out. Like, oh my goodness, this is so hard. Uh, But it's really not that hard. First Corinthians 6, 15 through 20, Paul says, flee sexual immorality, right? Run from it. In the Bible, we see two sacred relationships, God and man being the first one, the creator to the created. And we see a picture of that in the garden where it's beautiful. There's communion, there's relationship, there's freedom, there's joy, everything you could imagine, it's good. And then the second one comes in Genesis 2, where man and woman are together and they become one flesh. And it is within the confines of this relationship that sex belongs. And it's where God says that this is, this is your role. This is your assignment as humans, be fruitful and multiply, right? And that is what is, it is reserved for that relationship. Sexual immorality, which is sexual practice outside of that relationship, says God's plan for humanity was wrong. It says that we can do it better our own way, that God's plan is not good enough, right? It, at the heart of that is the exact same thing, it's pride. And we know that pride puts us in opposition to God. The apostles saw that these two things in culture were just literally pressing them into what would be the exact opposite of what God wants to do in your life. It's going to put you at odds with God. When he talks about idolatry in some of these scriptures, he said you will entice the Lord to jealousy, right? We can do things with our bodies and with our actions that put us at odds with God and does not allow room for the Holy Spirit to transform our heart. 
when we commit to those things, we basically open the door for God to begin his transforming work. This is what I'm seeing right here. They say you will do well in avoiding these things. And so these two become major themes throughout all of Paul's letters. You will see him constantly address these two. It's not just Paul. You'll see it in the other other epistles as well. Um, But what I love is Romans 12 too. This is a really reassuring, really good verse for me. And I'm going to read it from a different translation. Um, It says, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. God wants to do a transformational work. He's not looking for your behavior modification. He wants to start it here, and then he wants to work that out. I want to experience transformation. I know what comes across this heart and this mind at time, and I want God to change me. And I want it to start from the inside and work its way out. So I want to invite us into a moment of uh, reflection. We're going to wrap up really quick here. So in this time, um, you know, feel free to bow your heads and close your eyes. Maybe you want to spend some time in prayer. And I would ask you this question. Would you like to experience transformational work in your heart by the Holy Spirit? And if that's the case this morning, tell that to him. Invite the Holy Spirit in this moment to work in your heart, to open your eyes and ears and to be able to accept God's truth and how to have the wisdom on how to apply it to your life. I want to ask you, what is God saying to you this morning? What is he speaking to you? And what will you do with the truth that you heard today? Will you accept Jesus on his terms and on his words? When you have something in life that you need strength for, where do you turn? What things do you do? You may in this moment for the first time recognize some things that you've been trusting in, that you've been leaning on for strength, that you probably should have just trusted the Lord in that moment. And that's okay. It's good that you recognize these things. This is part of that transformational work. And if you realize you've done wrong, just know there's forgiveness. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We have a God that sees you and loves you and will forgive you. Maybe today you want to make a a commitment or a recommitment to trust in Jesus and Jesus alone for your strength, your power in life. Last question. How do you struggle in the area of sexual purity? Just as Christ dedicated his body for us, are we willing to dedicate our bodies to his plan, to see his plan as good and good enough? You know what, I'll ask this question to bring on any type of guilt or shame in life in this area, but if you're experiencing that right now, just pay attention for a moment. Maybe the Lord's trying to show you something that he wants you to change. And it is completely okay to make a commitment today towards purity, even if you have blown it in the past. There is no shame in saying today, I commit from this point moving forward. I want to live a life of purity so that God can have his way with my heart. Help me live transformed. And there is grace, grace, grace at the foot of the cross. He loved you and he died for you and he forgives you. And more than that, he rose from the grave in power and he is the source of your strength and power. The same spirit that rose Jesus Christ from the dead is available to you to work in you and through you. Will you let him have 
free reign in your hearts today. Will you put your faith in him?